Jane Harmon, president of the Wilson Center, welcome to HFX 2020. Delighted to be here. I've got my lobster on just like you, Robin. And everyone needs to know that you were once a scholar at the Wilson Center. I think everybody does need to know I was a scholar at the Wilson Center, and it's almost as proud a moment as it is for me to now interview the president of the Wilson Center uh, for HFX 2020. I mean, but I tell you, Jane, I mean, this has got to be the weirdest year um, I, I certainly I've experienced as an adult. And, uh, you know, by any standards, it's extraordinary. Um, after this whole thing's over, let's start out just in the most general uh, frame we can, we can draw. Do we just go back to the status quo ante? Uh, it, that's impossible. Uh, the world we knew and the close gatherings and the rock concerts and the hugs to multiple grandchildren, I happen to have eight of them, uh, are perhaps years from now, uh, sadly, uh, I would say. But there are also opportunities. Let me, let me just say that uh, this has to go away. It, it's not just that vaccines have been developed as of now, two of them, but people have to be vaccinated. And, and enough people have to be vaccinated to protect the rest of us. And the vaccine has to last a long time, which we hope will happen. And there has to be uh, an economic recovery and we have to deal with other things. So I, I'm not, not, not so fast, um, but can we go back? No. Can we be better? Yes. Uh, uh, President-elect Biden's statement of build back better is not just for the United States. I think it's for the world. And in some uh, strange and good ways, uh, this uh, horrible, horrible pandemic has been an accelerant of a few good things. I, you know, you might be surprised, but telehealth is now something uh, that everyone gets. It's probably 10 years ahead of where it would have been. And the use of uh, artificial intelligence um, to identify and trends in advance, in other words, to be proactive rather than reactive in healthcare has also happened. So, uh, the better piece of the build back uh, is is the dominant piece, and I think there may be a roadmap to get there. It's very interesting this this point about building back better. Um, it, we we all remember, or most of us watching, I presume, remember the two thousand and eight Great Recession, which was not simply an economic crisis. It it inaugurated a crisis in confidence allegiance and trust in the elites in society. Mm -hmm. um, is COVID going to do anything like that? Do we have to watch out for the unexpected rise or further rise of populism and distrust in our governments? Well, it, populism, economic populism won't end tomorrow either, just like uh, COVID. Why won't it? Because it is sadly uh, the underbelly of globalization and technology. Uh, we didn't notice that globalization, which sounded great and benefited numbers of people, probably including me uh, and my family, uh, didn't benefit a lot of people. It dislocated work uh, in particular. And uh, those people are left out. The income inequality has expanded. Uh, endemic poverty has expanded. Uh, and other issues like uh, systemic racism and even gender bias are being exposed by this. So uh, why am I saying this? Um, we have to do better than we did in 2008. We have to do a lot better. I, and I think we're smarter. And I, I do see uh, this being the proving ground for the old adage that Rahm Emanuel, a uh, former colleague of mine in Congress and then mayor of, of, uh, of, of uh, Chicago um, has said some time back, uh, which is don't let a crisis go to waste. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, you know, crises can go both ways, can't they? I mean, if we, I mean, one of the biggest uh, landmarks uh, of the 20th century was, of course, the Second World War. And it's interesting how some countries uh, had to completely rebuild from scratch and did very well. Other countries did very badly and some countries in the middle. Where's the United States going to go in that, in that sense? Do you think that there is a, a cause for optimism that America can learn from the crises that have been exposed, those problems that were already underneath the surface, such as the racial divide, which has been one of the deepest and mm -hmm. most profound problems for the United States? How do you see the future for America? Well, um, the, the racial divide is so much more serious than... Uh, people like me appreciated uh, until recently. I mean, we were founded, the United States was founded uh, in, in a kind of bipolar way. Um, the founding fathers, brilliant as they were, and they were all fathers, looked the other way and let slavery continue. Then we fought a war and slavery, or at least the practice of 
inequality uh, didn't disappear. Uh, we had the Emancipation Proclamation, but everyone wasn't emancipated. Uh, growing our way out of that and uh, dealing with this, uh, you know, these forces of globalization and technology will require an enormous amount of hard work. Uh, this is not going to be easy for anybody, not just blacks, but whites and privileged, uh, underprivileged, you know, name all the flavors. It, it's going to be hard for everybody. But I do see a promise. I think the, in some ways, the bones of America, the building blocks, the framework of America is, uh, is, is hope. And we're a hopeful and generous people. Uh, we can also be hateful and, and, um, uh, and, and, and intolerant. And we've seen some of that. But I think with the right leadership, not just from a president, uh, but the right leadership from a, a growing sense that we can do better, uh, America could become, could actually become the shiny city on the hill that Ronald Reagan uh, used to talk about. That's a very interesting uh, <clears throat> segue into the, into the broader questions of, of how democracies work together. Um, it can, seems as though it can go both ways with COVID-19. I mean, yeah. if you look in Europe, uh, in the European Union, in the very early stages, one of the very first things <clears throat> that countries did was to shut down their borders. Uh, there were then huge disputes, which, of course, have not yet been resolved, right. about whether Southern Europe will be properly bailed out by Northern Europe. Um, there's also, of course, the, the transatlantic relationship, uh, which was already under a certain amount of strain uh, under President Trump and, and his uh, view of the European Union as essentially a rival on the international stage. W when all is said and done, how do you think COVID is going to have affected the alliances between democracies, not just across the Atlantic, but also around the world? Well, COVID is a pandemic. By definition, it is a worldwide epidemic. We don't fix a pandemic by building higher walls and closing ourselves off. I know that Europe did that temporarily. Europe uh, has an interesting system, or the EU does, this Schengen system, uh, which was basically no borders. And so um, I, I can understand that as a, as a, as a short-term measure. But I think the challenge for Europe and us is, is to build back better. And the relationship, the transatlantic relationship, uh, is an enduring relationship notwithstanding the hits on NATO and notwithstanding uh, some of the disparagement of, of Western Europe, uh, not just by the United States and our leadership, but within Europe, uh, I, I predict uh, that uh, there's a chance both for Europe and the US and the transatlantic relationship to get much stronger. Uh, the EU is coping with the, the, the two-tiered economic divide. NATO is coping with that too. It's a two-tiered alliance. The U.S. provides most of the money, something President Trump has reminded us of repeatedly. Uh, but I, those, those things can be changed. Uh, and the nature of warfare has changed, so NATO has to change. And the nature of workfare has changed. So everything else has to change if the promise of a major trading uh, block is to be realized. Why do we want that? I think uh, it will help all of us. I can't see how pulling away from each other would, will, will help all of us in the long term. Jane, on, on a final subject, albeit a big one, it, it used to be said that all roads lead to Rome. Uh, it seems these days that all roads lead to Beijing. You can barely talk about any subject these days without the Chinese influence intruding upon it. Uh, and, and clearly, the, there has been a, a, um, a, a, essentially a paradigm shift in the way that the, the democracies of the world um, look at China in, in 2020, because uh, you know people, ordinary people, right. were were brought. It was brought to the attention of ordinary people uh, the the censorship of the virus in the early stages, which really you know most people have not really paid attention to, uh, to 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 oppression in China and the nature of the regime. What do you think COVID has done to the way that the United States and other democracies are going to relate to China uh, as as we go forward? Uh, it has been a, a sober reminder of, of I, I'd say, the, the, the downside of the kind of uh, government that China has. On the other hand, uh, I think the West has some blame here, too. Uh, we miss China's rise. China isn't rising. It has risen. Uh, we, with uh, uh, enormal, enormous hubris, uh, thought we were the world superpower. Well, no, it's a multi-power, multi, 
multipolar world. And now we have to get along with China. Uh, our national security strategy calls China a strategic competitor. So what do I really think? I think we should be clear eyed about the fact that letting COVID spread was in part, at least initially, China's fault. It spread in the U.S. because of a, uh, a failed strategy in the U.S. We can't blame all that on China. I certainly don't. But and, and intellectual property theft is China's fault. And other uh, and human rights abuses are China's fault, not uniquely. There are human rights abuses elsewhere. And China should be called out for that. On the other hand, the potential to get pandemics under control for the future and to build a global trade in a way that's fair to all is there. And uh, we won't get climate under control if we don't work with China. So um, mixed bag, but let's let's use COVID as a way both to uh, face truth and to accelerate to uh, a better future. And do you think, just, just as a supplement to that, that question, do you believe that the incoming uh, Biden administration uh, is going to be uh, as tough as the Trump administration? Of course, the style will be different, the way policy is formulated, but, but China shouldn't expect uh, incoming President Biden no. to be a soft touch, should they? I don't think so. And China bashing is a bipartisan sport in the Congress. It's gone on forever. It's one of the few bipartisan activities of the United States Congress. But I think that the Biden strategy will be very different. It will be rebuild our alliances and together face China. Uh, let's remember that we uh, unilaterally pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Huge mistake. And now a new trading alliance has just been announced by China. And the TPP actually exists, too. We're not neither one of those. Uh, and let's uh, also remember uh, that uh, uh, some of the, the tariffs imposed by our president unilaterally against China hurt our own farmers and required billions of dollars to, to bail them out. How is that, you know, making, <laughs> making the most of a, of a strategic competitor? And so I, at least as I see it, uh, Biden will uh, have a and should have uh, a list of grievances against China, but he'll have a more uh, 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 subtle strategy with a very experienced team, and he will be consistent. I think if there's one real rap on the current president, who isn't the first to bash China, as I said, it is that he hasn't been consistent. And I think we can build, build back better if we project consistent leadership uh, and, and uh, work with others in a way we haven't in years. Jane Harmon, president of the Wilson Center, thank you very much. Thank you.